Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. All right, everyone. Welcome in. It's the Apex Hour. It's Thursday afternoon, and I am so happy to be here today, as always. And we've had another awesome day at Apex Events, and I have author uh, David Anthony Durham in with me. Welcome into the studio. Lynn, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Yay! (laughs) Um, I have just been so having such a great time exploring your work, reading your books. And one of the things that just stands out is that you are a writer in multiple genres. I mean, let me see if I can name them all and then you can let me know. So literary, Western, fantasy, science fiction, historical fiction. Does that cover them? I mean, my goodness. Yeah, I guess you could add. I don't know if there's a subcategory there for um, superhero mutants kind of. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that vibe. There's, that's in there, too. <clears throat> you just have the coolest. I mean, that's just the coolest thing ever, you know. And I want to get into all the different, <laughs> you know, books. I mean, some of the titles that we've been talking about today are your, your Acacia trilogy uh, is a trilogy right now. Mm-hmm. And a Gabriel story. And your newest uh, book is The Shadow Prince. There are just so many things to talk about. But my first question for you, I'm always curious with I, with writers to ask the question, you know, when did you know this was what you wanted to do with your life? How did you how did you get started in writing? Wow, I haven't thought about this for a long time, but um although I was a a slow reader uh, and kind of reluctant reader, when I eventually did, you know, discover the hobbit and fantasy and suddenly was a voracious reader like just just like that um it was probably shortly thereafter that i i named my um my career there's a journal that i kept in eighth grade Uh, it was you know part of my english english class had to write something in it every day and part of what I wrote in it were stories. <gasps> wow. Okay. You actually just brought this back. It was oh memory back. Oh my gosh. I love this. Um, yeah. There was stories about a kind of a race of people-sized turtles. <gasps> and it, I was not, you know, copying off Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think it was probably before that even happened. <laughs> we won't but, tell. <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a fantasy setting, yeah. um, kind of warrior turtles. And uh, in particular, there's an entry in there where I say, and "This is yeah, this is eighth grade." Um, that I I want to be a writer. That, wow, that's, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. That's beautiful. I, I forgot about that for a while. Uh, we have to, I have to admit that. Yeah. Um, so that was eighth grade. By the time I went through high school, I was I was not the best the best student there. Um, and and then I rediscovered it uh, about a year, a couple of years into into my um, undergrad. Yeah. And and then it, it went back, it went to, oh, okay, wait, wait, I knew this in eighth grade. I'm supposed to be a writer. Let me get serious about it. So I did. That is amazing. The journaling, you know, that's such a special thing. I I remember doing that as well. And, and I think that that's just a great way. I mean, what a nice memory of that and that there were stories in it as yeah. well. So that's kind of your creative expression coming out right from the get go. And I guess the thing that occurs to me um, as well is gratitude to that teacher for yeah. for making me keep that journal. Um, Beautiful. I might not have remembered. Yeah. I might not have. I might not have um, <laughs> named my named my profession. Yeah. yeah. Well, fast forward to now. You've you've done so much. I'd love to ask you. We're, we're, I know it's kind of jumping mm-hmm. around, but mm-hmm. I'd love to ask you. Um, and we've talked a bit about it, but what does it feel like? to, you know, write in different genres? I mean, is it something that kind of was a natural evolution for you? Is it something that you sort of are, you know, standing on the hill proclaiming with, you know, I will be a multi-genre writer? Talk to me about the identity associated with with being involved in so many different genres. 
Okay. Well, I wouldn't say I, you know, stood on the hill and proclaimed it, but I do remember when I ended up with the, the agent I have, I still have now, um, Sloan Harris at ICM. I, I said, you know, we're doing my first book um, and we're talking about my, my future, my career going forward. And I said, what I'd like to do is, you know, write these literary novels and also, you know, maybe throw in, you know, a fantasy series at some point and, and you know, just be able to kind of balance and, and kind of go between the two. And he kind of went, mm, yeah, I'm not sure that that, that would work. Hmm. Um, because at the time, you know, there's a separation in, in the genres and um, it's not something that people um, did that frequently. Or um, some writers who would do it would um, do it under different names, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, I, you know, but okay, well, we'll see. Um, but the idea obviously um, stuck with me. And for me, it's it's not the, the best way to build a career in terms of establishing a name for yourself and a particular readership. Right. But in each case, as I've moved, I have probably lost some readers in the process and gained new readers um, as well. And for me, it's I, I do find inspiration in all in in so many genres. So it makes sense to also to write in them. I get excited about picking up sort of a slightly different toolkit, yeah. different reader expectations, um, and and kind of problem solving the way through a new genre. It, it it keeps it interesting. Well, I'd love for you to go into a little more detail about that because I'm super curious about those toolkits and about those reader expectations. I mean, I mean, I know these are generalizations, of course, but can you talk a little bit to, you know, what, what that means in terms of fantasy versus, uh, you know, historical or Western or, or young adult or whatever? Um, can you talk about what some of the toolkits might be and different techniques? Uh, and then also what different expectations are? Like, what do you th- how, how as a writer, do you look to those audiences? What differences are there? Hmm. Well, it, it's interesting that in some ways I, I look at them the same, mm. except that – so one, one of the big changes from my early days of writing very literary fiction was that my emphasis was all on uh, character – and character development and literary language and the, the, the structure of sentences, all of which is, you know, it's great. And I, I love a good literary novel. I would say, though, that my MFA program, you know, kind of looked down on on plot and, and drama and things happening. And that's when I when I ventured into uh, my first published novel that that's Gabriel's story that kind of pulled me into because it's set in the West. I needed to read some westerns, yeah. um, and I think somewhere in there, as I began writing that that novel and was into into it a little ways, I actually I remember I remember the day that um, I had a whole bunch of ideas like stuff was going to happen and there were going to be horse ra- horse like chases and and it was going to cover various states and there's going to be all this drama. And when my wife came home, I I told her, you know, I had all these ideas today of where this novel could go, but, you know, stuff happens. And I was kind of like puzzled. I was like, can I, can I do that? Um, <laughs> and, can I kind of write plot? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, my wife, who's, who's kind of awesome in all things, said, well, it sounds like you want to. So, <laughs> That's great. So do it. Yeah. So, so that that was that was one thing. And I'm a, I was aware when that novel got published – how humbling that experience was mm. like instead of feeling like hey you know i've i've you know i've conquered and conquered now, the yeah, western exactly yeah. yes it was more like wow people are going to be reading this now <laughs> um and that kind of fired a a, a a belief that i had to make sure that i was delivering for folks uh. you know like early on i the, the novels were very serious yeah. um and they were very issue oriented and i that was important to me but i i needed to remember to entertain and to you know to value people's time when when they're spending it um with with your words so make sure there's a good story there yeah. um so that's i it's not exactly a toolkit but that breakthrough 
it had to be important because yeah. it's the breakthrough that right. got me into print right. um, and that's continued. Yeah. Well, another question that that leads to what that what you were saying is, is um, do you have someone specifically in mind mm. as a reader or is it a general or is it yourself or is it – who do you think of when <laughs> – or do you think of someone in when you're writing? Yeah. Oh, I, I think of someone in between – this perfect reader who also likes to read across genres um, and likes to be entertained, but also read works that in some way or another engage with you know, questions of you know, what it means to be human um, mm-hmm. and how, how best to live, to live our lives. Um, and it's not so much that I think of, I wouldn't even say that between the adult genres, at least, that I, I really feel like I need to like have an entirely an entirely new readership. I always want to be bringing along some of the folks who read my earlier books, and and hopefully adding new ones, new readers to it. Like as much as you can kind of look at my books and by description and go, wow, they're they're kind of they're quite different. Mm-hmm. I would say there are themes that kind of weave you know right through all of them. Um, I I don't know that the the things that I write about in terms of ancient history and warfare in a novel like Pride of Carthage are all that different thematically than how I approach it in a novel like Acacia. Um, yeah, so, what are those themes that are most important to you in terms of your your personal statements? Ooh, I with both the like I think I think of uh, the the Hannibal novel and and Spartacus novel. They're both novels where you kind of know what happens. Like yeah. in neither case, do they don't win. Right. Um, things don't go well for either of them. Um, and I, I think that my approach to those is to to look at at all the the, the desires and aspirations, um, and you know, in, in many in many cases, you know, misplaced um, notions of, of national pride and, yeah. and greed and everything that lead to to those conflicts. Um, and to to take characters through that, ultimately it ends up being about the cost of of all that, all that war, all that damage. Yeah. Um, that the those themes are are definitely there in those novels. They also inform Acacia. Um, you know, I I didn't go into a fantasy with the notion that this is going to be about the forces of good and the forces of evil, and which you know is the, right. the, does the Dark Lord win or does the you know the right. the good do the good guys win? Because I, I never, I've never seen the world as as that cut, as that cut and dry. Mm-hmm. It's it's complicated, mm-hmm. and there are, um, you know, I, I, going in, into into any of them, I've always wanted to tell the stories kind of from both sides, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's there. It's it's an exploration of the cost of uh, the damage we do to one another, but al- also you know. Both Hannibal, toward the end of his novel, so there's a scene at the end of um, Pride of Carthage, where Hannibal has returned to uh, to Carthage, and he has been away from his family and from from his his, his children as well, and he's he's lost the war and it gets over, and he he's retur- returning to the city, and he goes and he sees his son and he kind of motions for his son to to come to him so that he can he can greet him. And his young son gets to him, and and cries like oh. because he. You know, and then what? What Hannibal? My Hannibal feels is it's it's as if he has brought home all of all of the death mm. and, and the violence and 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 the horror of war, and that his son you know doesn't know him. Um, and yeah. that that kind of realization is 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 yeah the the type of thing that yeah uh, is woven through through a lot of my writing. That's amazing. With some of these characters, particularly with Hannibal and Spartacus, who were who were real people, mm. historical figures, how do you we, – we talked a little bit about this um, in another session today, mm. but how do you sort of inhabit them? Um, and so, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about their – of course, there's the research, but I'm more interested in how you – how you glean from them, how, how you glean into them, I guess, mm-hmm, would be mm-hmm. the way, you know, and, and really get inside them. Yeah. It's not always easy. Yeah. Uh, in the case of the Spartacus novel, for instance, 
it, it took a long time. You know, I, I obviously I knew the events and that was fine. So there's a story to tell there. Just tell the events. But if I didn't connect with the character and feel like I understood um, my my imagined version of, of who he is, what he aspires to, why he does the things that we know that he did, um, I needed all that to make sense to me. So part of that process is it's not so much something that's done from uh, like ahead of time. I don't I don't sit down and and like map out a sheet. Right. Like, this okay, character is exactly. this way. Yes, he thinks this, this is how he feels. Yeah. yeah, right. It's much more about putting myself, um, you know, kind of right there on his shoulder, uh-huh. um, walking into a scene, um, and having him interact with people. And out of that, out of that process of almost having having him walk me through it, and many other characters. That's my approach to a lot of my point of view characters. They walk me into their part of of the story, um, and that that includes just filling in the filling in the gaps, yeah. imagining and being feeling free to to know that um, I don't know that a word that I wrote is um, anything that Hannibal actually said. Like, right, you know, right, it's, right. Um, but I'm not trying to do that. Absolutely, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to believe in this version of of Hannibal that. Hits all the all the the, the moments and events it needs to, but in a way that um, has resonance and feels feels true to me, at least a fictional truth. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Mm. Well, I want to play a little bit of a piece of music here, mm. um, but then when I come back, I really want to get a little bit more into talking and thinking about characters, and I have some other questions that though that that conversation just spurred for me. Um, (laughs) So as I was picking music for this, it was really interesting. I always try to kind of uh, come up with some connections. But you know, who knows this first one, um, we've been talking a lot about world building. And um, so I don't know, I was looking for things that that might be interesting in a world for me. And I've been really into this artist Sudan archives. And this song is called Island Moss. Um, So check it out. You're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. I'm tired. Watch through the window cold I 
love you soft like Iceland moss. I love you soft like Iceland moss. I hold you close like Iceland moss. I hold you close, then I saw you off. You All right, everyone, welcome back to the Apex Hour. This is Lynn Vartan. That song that you were just listening to was called Iceland Moss by Sudan Archives. As always, if you're interested in hearing the music that's played on the Apex Hour, you can go to Spotify and there is a Spotify open playlist called Played on Apex Hour. And you can check out all the wide variety of songs that I've played in the shows over the years. So I am in the studio with author David Durham. He is the author of the Acacia series, a Gabriel story, uh, the Shadow Prince, and many other things. Welcome back. Thank you. We were talking before about characters and about inhabiting characters. Um, I have another question about characters, and um, I'm asking it because in our conversations at, and meals and such over the past couple of days, you have said um, a couple of times, you know, for me to fall in love with this character. Mm. And, um, you know, I love that concept. And I wonder, is that, is that it? Is that it for you? You, you, when you, especially with your maybe protagonist or point of view characters, um, do you have to, in order to unlock them for yourself, do you have to sort of, um, fall in love as it will with them? I mean, figuratively? Yes. Um, especially with, with the main characters, you know, I kind of use that terminology, term, that phrasing a lot when I think of writing about Spartacus or writing about Hannibal. Um, but it's true to some degree with, with all the characters who, at least when I write from their point of view, I need to be able to understand some of the main things about them right. and to relate to those things. It's never as if I write a character um, who is, you know, who I can't, I can't understand aspects of, of who that person is. Um, no matter even even when they're pretty horrible there's mm. there, there's still some something that um that I can connect with or that I can know to be wear, wary of um so that's that's important and also there's an aspect of of finding of getting myself to a place where I kind of believe at least in in the zone of of the creative process I believe what they believe Mm. And there, there was an aspect of that, especially in um, in the Spartacus novel, The Risen, where I had to do to kind of make up a lot about um, the the religious worship of 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 these ancient Thracians in particular, and that was interesting because I had very little little to go on. Mm -hmm. I had some names and some vague notions, um, but. It felt important. It's going to be important to their characters, um, you know, what they believed and how how that uh, shapes the actions they take. And and so in the process, I was like, okay, what what would what would the god the god or the gods of of of, of these people uh, what would that what would that, that that deity be like? And I guess the process of doing that maybe sounds a little weird, mm. but it's not so much that I do it from the outside. It's more that. I am kind of imagining myself into into their mindset and convincing myself, at least temporarily, to right. believe what they believe. Yeah. So if I'm writing about some some you know some ceremony they're doing, um, I can't I couldn't write about it if it didn't to some degree make sense to me. Right. Um, right. And so that that's that's part of it, and also it, even just the process of of creating creating the characters and their story and how they move through a novel um, is fundamentally um, one of, so in the case of Pride of Carthage, begins with a, a foot soldier. And I'm like, okay, I this is going to be a novel with a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different experiences, which I have not had. Um, I've not been an, an ancient um, foot soldier. <laughs> but when I put myself um, in, in his shoes, it's like, okay, um, why is he there? Yeah. What what drove him to be there? What is what does he need? What is he trying to get out of this? 
um, what's what's at stake for for this character? What does he hope and aspire to? And all those things um, kind of get fleshed out as I'm as I'm living in in that character's skin. Yeah, and that's that's a fun it's a fun part of the process. And again, it's very different than than sitting down and like you know grafting out <laughs> who a character is. It's it's more done in the storytelling mode. Mm, um, I um, love that. Yeah. Well, let me go even more. Um, and so I, I teach music. And one of the things that I, I like to teach about is the different kinds of learning, like visual learning, oral mm. learning, kinesthetic learning, um, as you're learning a piece and getting gaining deep, deep learning of a, of a piece of music, you want to try to access in all those different ways. Mm -hmm. So we've talked quite a bit about characters. I'd like to kind of expand that conversation a little bit to the worlds around them. And I wonder, um, do you sit and see them? Do you hear them? You know, mm -hmm. what, what senses, are there multiple senses involved in your imagination as you are getting that stuff down on paper? Um, are you aware of that? I'm just curious about that, you know, especially when you're, because one of the things we've talked about a lot is the depth of your world designing. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered about that part of it. Interesting. <laughs> I guess it must be, yes, a, a very multifaceted um, combination of, 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 yes, um, of sensations and, and, and influences I'm thinking of acacia now, and in, in that case, yeah, it's definitely it's kind of creating a whole world, yeah, um, and and do, in very different landscapes in in this world, right. So I'm thinking about that now and going, okay, um, in a way, I kind of mapped that out in in the the opening the opening portion of the book um, has a a lone soldier. It's kind of, such a great opening, oh, by the way. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. I can, I have an image of the hair so much in that, you know, right. it's like, so it's burned in. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, it's funny. I can look back at, at something like, like that opening and, and, and realize that the process of writing that, that scene or that series of scene, yeah, that sequence is, is me getting on the, on this guy's shoulder and having him introduce the world to me. So he begins in this really Arctic landscape. Um, his people are in exile in, into the far north. And uh, kind of describe, you know, what the, what their, their fortress looks like. Mm -hmm. And and then he proceeds to to move down from, from there into more of the heart of, of the empire. And it gets warmer and it gets kind of more tropical. Um, so he's, you know, losing the accoutrements that, that he needed to survive yeah. in the cold. And... And taking on, you know, moving into a different climate and, and into different cultures and all of that, it's like, it's kind of funny to, to look back at that now and go, oh, right. I, I was I was learning um, what what it feels like to move through this world oh, wow. um, by having him, him do it. I mean, he, he, he's on a, a mission of assassination. Right. But, right. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so, uh, so do you – so this is such an interesting thing because it's like you get – inside the novel as you're going i mean you mm. kind of are inside it right you're on his on his shoulder so yeah. to speak yeah. and and so when you sit down to write in a day let's say um do you uh do you s sit and see him do something and then write it or i mean do you see a complete scene does it happen step by step what's that like <sighs> wow um it's it's confusing. Ah, okay. Um, there's when I am really um, kind of deeply into into a novel, and that's a great that's a great place to be. I, I need to be deeply into a novel um, again soon. I, yeah, I, I need to be back there. Um, it's it becomes part of the fabric of of every day. It, so it's yeah. not just that I sit down at the computer. And at that point, I'm I'm uh, you know, getting gotcha. into the into their head. I mean, that's that's one of the main times. But once I'm really kind of in the story, it's aspects of it are playing out in my mind, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I will be. There's not that much a separation between being in front of the computer with my fingers on the keys, um, between that and and washing washing up dishes after yeah, dinner. Yeah. Because I can be there and something occurs to me like, mm. oh, that 
something clicks into into place about what happens next in the story uh, or about why that happens next um and okay this is gonna this might seem weird but but it worked uh when i was writing the the risen it was it was a slow novel that kind of came to me slowly it wasn't always easy um you know novel number seven i'm like oh it should be easy (laughs) no i i had to had to relearn how to approach it fascinating and one of those ways was there would i get a feeling when I knew I'd, I'd reached a problem in the story and I wasn't quite sure what to do next, but I, I'd feel like I'm, I'm aware that, that the, the answer is, it's kind of like just, you know, it's hiding somewhere, but I can feel the shape of it. I feel that it's there. I just don't have it. So when I lived in uh, Western Massachusetts, we were out in the woods and there was a path, a particular bit of path behind our house in the woods. And when I had that feeling that, okay, there's something a mom was going to get, I just, yeah. I would go out to that, that bit of path and I'd walk really slowly and I would just look down at, oh, at the path. Yeah. And it was as if I was looking for a small object on, on the ground. And when I did that, if I just walked slowly enough and for long enough, I almost always found it. That's awesome. It's kind of weird. No, that's <laughs> awesome. It's like a meditation. I mean, it's a moving meditation of sorts, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I, I completely get what you're saying about uh, you know, when you're deep into something. I mean, I think musicians feel that. I know when I'm learning a big piece and I'm deep in the learning process, the same if I'm washing dishes, all of a sudden I'll realize that it's playing in my head. Yeah. You know, somebody once said to me, do you always hear music in my head? And my answer was like, no. But then the, for the next week, I started to kind of pay attention. Mm. And I was like, oh, yeah, it is always in my head. I right. just never really was alert to it or not so that that sounds awesome i mean what a cool process and yeah i I guess there are similarities there yeah and it is funny to think about how much how how many how often the the important revelations and um and plot details and or the other thing is there are a lot of occasions where i will have written something uh, early in a book and only figure out you know what that thing is and and how it resonates with the with the the whole novel much later um and that's that can be a weird process too Mm. it's like you know um so it's it's like four months later and a couple hundred pages in and and it's like oh that that ring that he put on you know it's like that's that's I just figured out where that came from. Oh my and gosh, what that means that's amazing. And how that's going to change the story. Yeah. Our mind is so, what a fascinating yeah. thing. That's it so is. cool. And that's, that for me only happens when I, when I'm doing the writing, mm. you know, as opposed to going, okay, let me, let me just think up, you know, all these important things that are going to happen. And oh, that's interesting. It's, it's, yeah. It's once I'm, I'm actually in the story um, and, and living with it that, um, that there, there are these connections um, that I, I didn't see before. I don't know that I could see them yeah. if I hadn't, if I wasn't just spending the, um, the mental time, almost twenty four hours a day um, yeah. with it. So, are you the type of worker uh, writer? Uh, like, what's a typical writing day? I know we all have many different kinds mm-hmm. of days, but what's a typical writing day for you? You know, there's, of course, that saying like, well, there's no such thing as the muse coming and knocking. Yeah. I knock her over the head and drag her along, <laughs> you know? And and so are you s- sort of wait for the spark or you get in uh, regularly and then let the spark come through? H- how does that work for you? <laughs> uh, you know, some, I frequently feel um, that my answer is to, to questions are so contradictory <laughs> um, because it's kind of, it's never one thing. Ah, interesting. I, I mean, I absolutely believe that fundamentally um, I can't expect the the story, the muse, you know, to, to come to me. I, I have to go there. I have to go right. and, and put my fingers on the keys and begin to, to find my way into the story. And, and if I do that, then the ideas, yeah. the ideas show up. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. It's like, okay, you, you've spent enough time trying. Here's here, here's a nugget. I'm right. Like, oh, okay, great. I have that now. <laughs> um, and part there can be days uh, or you know, moments or, or writing days that are are like that, and that's exactly what I what I need. There are other days when things aren't going well. Yeah. And you know, it's sometimes if they're not going well, I I I, I stay there and I try to make it work. And 
maybe, maybe something comes out of that. Or maybe I go, you know what? It's not happening today. Uh, it's time for me to stop. And yeah. maybe the, the best way forward is for me to walk away from the computer right, <laughs> just right, now um, right. and, and, and do something else. And so that, so it's like what, what works one day mm-hmm. as part of the process might not work the next day. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a matter of, of just knowing that one way or another, I'm going to, I'm going to show up and, and, and try to do the work and, um, and I'll be rewarded with, for it. Um, if, if I do that, do that enough. Yeah. yeah. This, we got so quickly into such a great deep conversation that I feel like we should um, let anybody listening kind of have a little, um, you know, sort of the, 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 the two minute synopsis of some of the books that we've been talking about. You know, I, um, I feel so comfortable talking with you, but now I feel like we should share with people. So I know we've talked about the risen, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and we've talked about the pride of Carthage mm-hmm. also, but I wonder if you might give us a little sort of, yeah, w- the risen, what is it about? Mm-hmm. And we, we've, we've touched on a little bit, but for sure. anybody who might be like, oh, I'm really interested in this guy. I want to get one of the books. What are, <laughs> so w- tell us about okay. the risen. Okay. Well, the risen is kind of, in a way, it's a companion book to Pride of Carthage. Both feature um, historical figures that were enemies of Rome. So it's, mm-hmm. um, that seemed to be something that attracted me. Mm-hmm. And so The Risen, it's about the Spartacus Rebellion um, in ancient Rome. And it's, you know, he is, he is the main character in terms of the main character of importance. And he is one point of view. But when I, I write a novel like that, um, I don't. I never want a big story like that to be told from only one character's mm. point of view. So there are actually uh, ten point of view characters wow. in that novel. The idea being that um, any war it doesn't it doesn't just affect the the leaders, doesn't just affect the general. It affects everyone else in in that society as well. So the point of views uh, are everything from foot soldiers to camp followers. Um, children's point of views to um, hmm. um, older people's point of views. Um, and it's a real mixture that I, I hope c- tells kind of a, a people's history of the Spartacus rebellion. Um, and so that's, that's what, what that one is. And, you know, Pride of Carthage, Pride of Carthage similarly yeah. is a similar approach um, to Hannibal being the main focus and his war with, with, um, with Rome, the second Punic war that was important for he was important for Rome's history. Um, he he came so very close to to defeating them, uh, but when when as he failed, eventually, um, that was the conflict that allowed Rome to kind of solidify its control of the Mediterranean and become what what it became. Um, and it's another one where I wanted to have lots of different points of view, um, and and representation from different different parts of the experience. Uh, that's. It's kind of one of the ways I like to approach the the bigger novels. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I read a read a novel a while back that was you know, a first person narration of from Hannibal's point of view, and I was like, mm, this, <laughs> "This is so limited." It's, 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 there's so, what about what about everybody, everybody, everybody else? else? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. So, and then we've also spoken a bit about Acacia, mm-hmm. uh, the Acacia trilogy. Could yeah. you give our listeners a little bit of a snapshot of that? <laughs> Acacia is uh, an epic fantasy trilogy set in a, um, you know, it's a, a magical, fantastical world. It gets a bit more magical as, as it goes. My desire there was to create uh, a fantasy world that represented the real world diversity that kind of looked at um, the, the, the complex um, ethnicities of our world and the cultures that come out of that. And to imagine that into a fantasy space. So that was a big part of it. I was also inclined to look at the notions of, of empire and national mythology. You know, any nation, they, mm-hmm. we, we have a version of ourselves that, that we tell that is maybe history, but right. also has, has a lot of myth in, in there to, to validate the things that we've done. So it, it's a novel in which the, the, the good guys, um, you know, don't have a clean slate. Yeah. And um, the apparent get bad guys, well, they're not, you know, it's it, it's more complex it's complicated. than that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I like those complications. Um, but it's also uh, a, a novel that, or a novel series that taught me, um, 
taught me how to write fantasy, I guess. Ah, and that's cool. part of why it began lower magical. Mm. Um, and it gets more fantastical as it goes. Cool. Um, I think I got more comfortable with it. And and also oh, the world. That's interesting. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, cool. Another thing about that one that I liked is that there's the initial world, um, kind of a, the known world around Acacia. And but part of what happens is that they, this empire, it does have a, a a trade across the ocean with basically um, an unknown entity out right, there. Right. And I, when I wrote the first book, um, I didn't know what was over there, yeah. you know? And, and that was really part of what drew me into the second. And so the, you didn't yeah, know either. I did not know. Nope. Oh, that's like a cool little inside, <laughs> inside tip there. They, and that that's why there's a second book because yeah. part, part of me is like, okay, I'm going to looking at the globe. I, I can only see this much of it, um, but I'm going to turn it a little bit. And, oh, that's and so cool. you know, what's on the other side of that yeah. ocean. And then I get over there and who are those people? Why are they participating in this trade? What do they want out of it? Um, that's, that's a fun, a fun part of the process as well. Um, so epic fantasy that hopefully reads a bit like it's a fleshed out world mm -hmm. as if it's a, um, an epic historical. Yeah, it does. Oh, it okay. definitely does for sure. <laughs> cool. Absolutely. Right. Well, there's two other novels that we could talk about more, but two <laughs> other novels in particular that we've been um, sort of uh, touching on here and mm. there. And, and that is uh, Gabriel's story, which is your first published novel, right? That's right. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. First published novel, not first novel. Right. I, I wrote two um, that were unpublished. A little bit of, of one of those became some of the key ingredients of Gabriel's story. It's a, I guess you could call it a Western, and a, a, an African-American Western set in the 1870s. Um, the family dynamic, um, which I initially wrote in a contemporary sense, is is all kind of intact. It just, the story became really different when I, I plucked it up in time and space and, and moved it to Kansas in the 1870s. It's a story partly about homesteading, partly about a disgruntled boy who um, does not like his, his stepfather and um, chooses to go off on his own and um, gets in a lot of trouble <laughs> in, in the process and comes to value a value a lot of what he left behind. And it's, it's his journey, his circular journey um, mm. out into the world and then back and to then his back, family. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. That's, that's that one. I had, a, I've had a long his interest in, in history and American history and African American history. And I was very aware that in the historical record, African Americans, um, they came West as, as they went North, um, you know, after post post slavery. And I, but I felt like there weren't enough depictions, mm -hmm. um, of, of them getting to the West and, and right. trying to make participating in that part of America's right, history. Right. So I was excited to, to write about that. Um, so, a little bit of a of a family story, a little bit of a historical um, you know, desire I had to to explore a topic, and they they came together in in that in that novel. And then your newest book, yeah, the newest book is The Shadow Prince. Mm -hmm. This is my it's my first um, middle grade fantasy, so it's like a bit younger than YA, something that can be read by. Um, what can, can can be read to kids kind of throughout elementary school um and and then they they can start reading it themselves um into, into kind of middle school age and in that in this case it is it's ancient egypt but a, a magical ancient egypt that's also a solar powered ancient egypt so cool <laughs> thank you it's um it's meant to be light and fun there are there are a lot of kind of well, there are a lot of gods of the Egyptian pantheon that are in it, and most of them and their traits are based on the the historical record um, because they were so interesting and diverse mm -hmm. and shape-shifting um, and quirky. Um, at least there's a way of seeing them that way, and that that's how I envisioned it. Um, the Shadow Prince uh, himself is a, uh, a young boy, um, a 12-year-old boy named Ash, who competes with other other children who were born on the, the same day to be the bodyguard confidant of of um, a prince of, of Egypt. And when that person wins that competition, which is seemingly deadly, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they, they get that role um, for, for life. 
And um, that's what he sets out to do. Um, nothing is quite as he as he thinks yeah. um, at at the at the beginning. He learns some things yeah. at the end. Um, but yeah, it was that engagement with um, with ancient Egypt, but wanting to do so in in a fun way, and in a fun semi modern way because of the shadow shadow because uh, of the solar aspect to it. Um, there's a technology that's powered by by this by the sun, as we have in our own world. But yeah. They they did it first in ancient Egypt. That's so cool, yeah. We uh, steampunk fantasy. I mean, that's so awesome. Solar, solar punk, punk solar fantasy. Punk. Yeah, of go. course, solar <laughs> punk fantasy. That's so amazing. All right, I have kind of a crazy question. Okay. Um, if you could, you've written so many uh, just amazing characters, so developed. If you could become hmm. any one of your characters. Wow. Is there one that comes to mind that, and I mean, of course, I'm sure in a way you, you have become all of them as you've written them, but I mean, like, is, does one kind of stand out like, yeah, I'd, li- I'd like to, I'd like to do a stint as that character, you know, like, I don't know. Is there any one of them? Wow. That's <laughs> interesting. And I'm sure it would change it depending on where you are in your life, you know, at different times. But right now, is there a particular character either main character or a side character or whatever that you, if you could become a character who, who kind of turns you on in that way right now? <laughs> well, I have to go with, with what, what popped in, <laughs> popped in first. Yeah. Um, that's Mina, Mina Akarin from uh, the Acacia trilogy. She, it's almost like I, yes, I wrote her, Yeah. but the notion of, you know, what would it, be like to be this um, kind of amazing, strong, feisty, you know, wonderful warrior, yeah. um, kind of person um, yeah. who who sees an awful lot and yeah. and comes to her own in in a very different setting than she was raised in, um, finds power in a variety of ways, and and actualizes that. Um, so that that's what comes to mind. I love it. Yes, I wrote her, but it's like you know, if I could actually be her. I, how would what, what would that be like? Yeah, um, that's that would, cool. That's interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for that. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm going to play one more song, and this song I chose purely for the title, which is called "Build a Better World." <laughs> uh, I don't know that they're thinking about fantasy worlds per se, but I just thought that that would be kind of a fun uh, a fun way in um, in the context of what we're talking about here. If I can get it, there it goes. And um, yes, yeah, so it's "Build a Better World" by London Electricity. You're listening to KSU Youth. Fun. 91. I've been on my way down. I've been living with the lights out. Getting troubled by the idle sounds of the day to day. I know I let you down. I did nothing to protect you. Didn't know how much you went through. And now it's too late. Struggling, sitting in your cold water 
went through Doing anything to numb your way to an empty space Staring at the ceiling Trying to figure out a meaning Trying to buy into the feeling Of a better place I wish I did more to love you I wish I did more All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. That was Build a Better World by London Electricity. Uh, you're listening to KSU Youth under 91.1. This is the Apex Hour. And I am here with David Anthony Durham. And we are just about to close our hour with our favorite, favorite question of the whole day, which I ask all my guests, um, which basically the question is what's turning you on this week. Um, but before we get to that, I want to make sure to mention your website. Can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and any social media that you'd like to share, anything like that? Sure. Uh, my website is just my name at davidanthonydurham.com. And that's that's the main resource. I I am on I'm on Facebook, um, Twitter, though not not I'm not that proficient at Twitter, but <laughs> I'm there. Um, and Instagram as well. Um, and all just you know searching searching by my name. Awesome. You can find me. And you can find the books anywhere. Um, and there are audiobooks of almost everything, right? Yes. Yep. There is everything's available on on audio, and um, and all the books uh, remain in print, um, and certainly you know available online, easy to find if if not in your local bookstore. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so now to our last question of the day, and that is, what is turning you on this week? And it can be anything. It can be a book that you're reading or a magazine or a TV show or a movie or a favorite food or we've had, it can run the gamut. So David Anthony Durham, what is turning you on this week? <laughs> oh, there are two things that, that come to mind. Um, one is that I've, I've just handed in the the, the, ne- the draft of the second Shadow Prince novel. <laughs> So continuing that story into a series uh, that really excites me. Awesome. And the other thing, it's it's something I've been been doing semi secretly um, last couple of years. It's 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 writing and being involved in in TV. Ooh. Um, not stuff that I can really talk about at the moment. That's, I that's know. the frustrating part of yeah. it. Yeah. But um, I have been involved with a, a number of of developing shows. Uh, shows and that process of working collaboratively with being in a room with people just talking right through the day about Ugh. what what the, what's the story and who are the characters and and you know what's the best version of this and and bouncing ideas off each other not, not being afraid to throw out ideas um i've i've been amazed each time um i've had one of those experiences that at the end of the end of the weekend of the session it's like there's all this stuff. There's there's a, there's a show on the board, and it all makes sense. Um, that has been exciting. Writing scripts has been exciting. Oh, it, it's cool. It's it's still storytelling, but yeah. it's doing it with a different tool tool yeah. toolkit. Yeah, and um, that's you know maybe that's part of my uh, you know it's I'm I'm, I'm going into a, a different a different format, but that keeping it interesting and trying something new is exciting. Um, and 
and they they pay pretty well too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's super secret, so I'm not going to ask any questions <laughs> about it. But I will look forward to the opportunity to have you back, maybe when things are <laughs> a little bit more pronounced, and then when, maybe when we're getting ready for premieres and things one of like these, that. One of these days, I'll have so much fun actually talking about, about these bet. projects. Yeah. <laughs> well, David, thank you so much for your time. I, again, for our listeners out there, check out the books. I mean, what if you want to just get immersed in so many different worlds and different genres? Uh, it's just it's just awesome. So it's been a pleasure to learn about your experience. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you for having me. It's been great. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it for us, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.